Good morning. Welcome to Stay at Home Worship from St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Oakland, Maryland. I'm Pastor Scott Robinson, and today we welcome Debbie and Sean Beachy, our music directors, who are providing special music for our worship service. Uh, hopefully, before too long, we can worship in person again. Meanwhile, if you would like to help support our ministries and benevolence commitments, you can donate through our webpage or Facebook page. Now, today's stupid joke. A pastor friend of mine is finishing her first Advent Christmas season in a new call today. I asked her how it was going and she said, you know how in most congregations half of the people do all the work and the other half hardly do anything? And I said, I sure do. She said, it's funny, but in this congregation, the reverse is true.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have filled us with the new light of the Word, who became flesh and lived among us. Let the light of our faith shine in all that we do. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Ephesians, the first chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel of the Lord according to John, the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth, and truth come through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. God of wisdom, may your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Amen. The French term is déjà vu. It literally means already seen. In English, we call it paramnesia. It's that weird psychological phenomenon that makes you feel like something brand new that's happening has somehow happened before. They say 70% of human beings experience paramnesia at least once in their lives. I know I just did, because I swear I've read the John the Baptist story before, and it seems like quite recently. Oh wait, I have. In fact, three times in just the last five weeks. 
because John is featured in the Gospel readings every second and third Sunday of Advent, and then he makes an encore appearance here on the second Sunday of Christmas. Next week is the first Sunday after the Epiphany, on which we celebrate the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord. Want to guess who's doing the baptizing? So sorry, John, but if you don't mind, I might just talk about something else. We could play Bible trivia. I know I've asked you before, what's the shortest verse of the Bible? And some of you knew right away, saying, Jesus wept. But that's actually a trick question based on a bad translation. Because in John chapter 11, verse 35, the Greek word dekruo, meaning weep, is written in the form of an aggressive or inchoative aorist, meant to highlight the onset of an action rather than the action itself. Pay attention, this will be on the test. So a better translation would probably be the way the NRSV renders it, Jesus began to weep, or more dramatically, Jesus burst into tears which is nowhere near the shortest verse of the Bible. Some think the shortest verse is Job 3, verse 2, which is often translated as Job said. But it's actually three words in Hebrew, which literally means something like Job answered, saying, so that's not it either. Give up? The real shortest verse of the Bible is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Pantote kairete is how it reads in Greek, meaning always rejoice, or rejoice always. Do you know the longest sentence in the Bible? Actually, today you should, because it was our second reading from the book of Ephesians. Most translators cut it up into several sentences to make it easier to follow, but in the original Greek, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14 is all one long sentence. And it's not only the longest sentence in the Bible, it may be the longest sentence in all of Greek literature. But it's not just some big, old, ugly run-on. It's in fact a carefully crafted, highly complex, complete thought, consisting of numerous independent and dependent clauses, skillfully woven together in a way that would truly be appreciated by any dedicated grammarian, which, as my last sentence clearly betrays, I am not. Ephesians has six chapters containing more than 150 verses, and we're scheduled to read more than half of them in the year ahead. So I figure a little background now couldn't hurt. Language scholars say Ephesians and 1 Peter are by far the New Testament's most skillfully written works. Unfortunately, neither is probably anybody's favorite book of the Bible, at least these days. Both were clearly written for their own situations and circumstances, and they don't cross the barriers of time and culture very well. Some of their passages were in fact used to defend slavery in the antebellum American South, as well as to justify centuries of the oppression of women, both in the church and in society at large. But biblical scholars suggest there are a few things we should consider before passing judgment on Paul's letter to the Ephesians, pointing to three things they say Paul's letter to the Ephesians is probably not. First, they say it is probably not a letter, even though that's what your Bible may call it. In fact, none of the biblical epistles are really letters in the modern sense of the word. Paul's epistles weren't the sort of correspondence folks would stuff into their Christmas cards. He wasn't writing to bring folks up to speed on, like how Timothy was getting along in college, or to tell folks about the baby's first steps. In other words, Paul's epistles were not the sorts of writings meant to be posted on the refrigerator with a magnet. Paul's epistles were really persuasive speech manuscripts, or more accurately, sermon texts, intended to be read aloud or preached to gather the assemblies of believers in the local house churches of early Christianity. Literacy rates were low in the first century biblical world, and since few of the early Christians were among society's privileged, probably not many early churchgoers could have read Paul's epistles anyway, even if they wanted to. 
Paul's sermons normally address specific problems, disputes, divisions, and questions with which particular congregations were wrestling. Which brings me to the second thing that Paul's letter to the Ephesians is probably not. It probably was not written to the Ephesians. It doesn't mention any specific issues or difficulties they may have had. And the earliest manuscripts do not identify the intended recipients or any church community. Scholars say the words, to the saints who are in Ephesus, from verse 1, were added sometime in the late 2nd century. Most think what we call Ephesians was actually a sermon intended for broader appeal, probably meant to be an encyclical of sorts, circulated among the various churches of Asia Minor. The third thing scholars insist Paul's letter to the Ephesians is probably not, is that it probably is not really from Paul. Paul's undisputed writings lack long, complex sentences like the one we just read. Paul's sentences were more like his talking points, simple and straightforward. The fairly short epistle to the Ephesians has nine different sentences of over 50 words each. Paul didn't write like that in any of his other sermons. Ephesians also uses many words not found in the undisputed Pauline epistles, and many of the concepts common to Paul's writings are given completely different meanings here. In other sermons, Paul says we Christians will be saved. Ephesians says we already are. Elsewhere, Paul anticipated the imminent end times Ephesians instead prepares its readers for the fact that that might not happen anytime soon. Elsewhere, Paul speaks of equality among men and women, slaves and their owners. But in its so-called hostafilm, or household codes, Ephesians lays out a complex hierarchy for both church and family, with men at the top. Ephesians supports marriage with husbands in charge, Paul's other epistles generally don't favor marriage at all. And while elsewhere Paul says that in Christ we are no longer male or female, slave or free, the author of Ephesians indicates, oh yes we are, so know your place and stay in it. And now you know that Paul's letter to the Ephesians probably wasn't a letter from Paul to the Ephesians. So maybe we should mention a few things that Paul's letter to the Ephesians definitely is. Ephesians was written to the third generation of Christians, probably from someone in the second. It was a passing of the baton of sorts, a handing off of the faith born of Paul's generation to its grandchildren. The church had changed over those many years, as had its faith understanding. By this time, Christians were mostly Gentiles who didn't really know how to get along with or relate to the remaining Jews among them. Many credit, or in some cases blame, Ephesians for institutionalizing the church, teaching that regardless of what we look like or where we come from, we are united in Christ's body with one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. It presents ours as a faith a faith designed to sustain us over the long haul, rather than just carry us over until tomorrow or the next day when Jesus is expected back. I especially appreciate the Ephesians' notion that Christ was not just the Jesus of the past or the Jesus yet to come. Christ is also the Jesus of the here and now, who is with us daily to support us, forgive our trespasses, and deliver us to our rightful inheritance as God's own people. Ephesians speaks of heavenly places accessible to us now, assuring us we can experience Christ, not just at the end of our lives, or even at that long, elusive end of the age. And I don't know about you, but I like the kind of Jesus who knows where we are and what we're going through, and can get us through the tough days when we feel sad and lost. You know, the same sort of Jesus who many years ago began to weep or even burst into tears when his friends were struggling. 
Ephesians invites us as a community of faith to rise from the dead and let Christ shine upon us. And while I'm not nuts about all the gender bias and pro-slavery stuff, I certainly can relate to the notion that we are one in this church, regardless of what we look like or where we come from. Which I guess is why the real Paul's shortest verse of the Bible really didn't need any more words. Salvation is offered to all of us through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let us pantote carete, rejoice, always. Amen.
Joining our voices in the song of the angels, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Redeeming God, you gather together your people from the farthest parts of the earth. Protect your church from stumbling. Let it not be overcome by sorrow, division, or despair. Make us radiant with goodness that we might live always to the praise of your glory. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You bring together heaven and earth. All creation testifies to your splendor. Hold the ecosystems of this earth in delicate balance, from coastlands to farmlands, forests to wetlands, deserts to rainforests. Show us new ways to live in harmony with the world around us. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You overflow with grace upon grace. Expand the imaginations of those who serve in positions of authority. Open their hearts to the needs of their nations and communities. Protect all those in harm's way and those risking danger for the sake of others. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You bring consolation to those who weep. Embrace those who feel far off, excluded, or defeated. Accompany those living with chronic and invisible illness. Sustain the weak and weary. Refresh those who labor under the weight of pain or sickness. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You come to us in the beauty of darkness and of light. Bring justice and reconciliation to communities divided by oppressions and misuse of power. Guide us to speak holy words of advocacy and truth. Help us to honor your image in one another. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You turn our mourning into joy. We give thanks for those who have died in faith. With all the saints, give us our inheritance in Christ. In the fullness of time, gather us all together in your mercy. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of mercy, come quickly to us with grace upon grace as we lift these and all our prayers to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. 
Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.